Koinonia is the Greek word that encapsulates the idea of participating or sharing. Either you're sharing in a job or sharing life together or whatever. And that is what we're going to look at today in this episode of Dig Deeper. We're beginning a three-part series on uh, witness, mercy, and life together. These are This is the threefold emphasis of the work in our Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. And so that's what we're going to do. Now, this also is beginning a three-week uh, short circle, small group set, we call it. And uh, so there's no opening question for this Bible study because that was already done in the um, quick start part of the short circle guide to make sure our small groups function well. So, koinonia, sharing life together. Unlike most of the other Dig Deeper Bible studies, this is going to be a galloping overview of these three ideas that are essential to the work of the church. Witness, mercy, and life together. The Greek word that captures the idea of the body of Christ doing life together is koinonia. This word contains the idea of sharing or participating in something. And so we're going to begin by uh, moving through a few things the Bible talks about us sharing. And of course, we're going to end up talking about our uh, sharing life together, but that's a sharing of life together that grows from a, uh, a profound place in our lives. The first thing the Bible says, well, not the very first thing, but uh, where we're going to start anyways, is the Bible says that Christ shares in our flesh and blood in order to destroy death. He participates in our flesh. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 says, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise, that's Jesus, partook of the same things, so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. So Christ entered into our mortality in order that he might destroy death, then in order that he might break our chains to the one who uh, is what the Bible calls the prince of this world. And so he, had, he entered into fellowship with us in our mortal flesh and blood. Because of that, we are in fellowship with him when we, of course, live in faith. Uh, we are in fellowship with God's Son. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 9 says, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So there we find the core of the fellowship of Christians. It starts with Jesus Christ, the Son of God, uh, coming to earth to take fellowship with us in our flesh and blood, to be born, to live, to die and rise again, breaking what the Bible calls the chains of death. And in him now, all who follow him have the fellowship of those who follow Jesus Christ. And uh, startlingly, uh, the scriptures tell us that we it's not just a fellowship with each other, that we have a participation in the divine nature because of this. Look at uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. By which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you might become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. So Christ participates in our flesh and blood, and so we participate with him, and through Christ we participate in the divine nature. And coming out of all this, being connected with Christ and in, in, uh, in the divine nature, we end up also connected with and participating with, sharing with uh, one another. We are in fellowship with each other through God's Son. 1 John chapter 1, verse 3 says, That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And so it's that fellowship in Christ that ties together the fellowship of the Christian church. And that fellowship includes uh, great things, including, the scriptures tell us, the forgiveness of sins. 
Look at 1 John 1 verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And, and so that tells us that, that right at the base of everything is the idea not of perfection, uh, at least perfection achieved by humans, but of forgiveness and cleansing in Christ. That's what binds the church together. That is the thing from which our fellowship grows, is the forgiveness of sins we find in Jesus Christ. We are not perfect people in fellowship. We are rescued sinners in fellowship. And that makes all the difference in the way our life together plays out. Uh, that, that makes all the difference in not uh, having a community of judgment in not having a community of uh, hypocrisy and pretend because our fellowship is in, at its core, the forgiveness and peace that we have been given in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Now, moving on, to life in the early church, and that's the text uh, from uh, last Sunday, which I don't know when you're listening to this now, but for me, last Sunday is May 11th, 2014. In Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, uh, we are given a picture of of life in the early church, a very concise picture. And let me just, I'm going to read the whole thing to you, and then we're going to go through it verse by verse. It says, uh, of the people in the church, in the fellowship, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved." So that's uh, the very, very exciting time at the very beginning of life in the early church. And that's what we want to walk through today. So beginning with verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Now that is a mouthful and no mistake. Four huge things. The first thing I would point out, or at least offer as a point of discussion, is something about which there is some contention. Of course, this the church is an assemblage, a fellowship of human beings. So there's going to be lots of contention and differences of opinion uh, and, and thoughts about different things. But I think one of the things that distinguishes the church, hopefully, uh, is the love with which we speak about things, even when we disagree about them. So the first thing to notice is that it says the apostles teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. And the word the there puts a, puts a very, puts a definiteness on those words. It's not just any sort of teaching. It's not just any sort of fellowship. It's not just any sort of breaking of bread. And it's not just any sort of prayers. These are core. They are the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, the prayers. Now, some people, and this is where the contention comes in, some people take that further and find uh, f and see in the word the a reference to prescribed elements. Uh, the apostles' teaching, of course, that we're okay with, everybody's okay with that being sort of a prescribed, this is the, the teaching that actually comes from the apostles. and But when we get down to the fellowship, uh, people of a more liturgical bent might see that as actually rites of fellowship, uh, which could, I don't know, I suppose include foot washing or, or uh, you know, where 
they talk about greeting each other with a holy kiss, but, you know, people uh, greet each other with kiss in those cultures. Anyways, we don't do that so much. But uh, if you haven't uh, been there, I'm sure you've uh, seen um, movies with uh, Middle Eastern culture where people are greeting each other with kisses all the time. If you want to experience that, go visit a Greek Orthodox church and you'll see everybody greeting each other with a kiss. <laughs> But uh, the fellowship, they would see liturgical elements in that. And the breaking of bread, they would see the Lord's Supper in that. And, uh, you know, it's quite possible that that's a reference to both. Uh, the fellowship uh, meals, this sort of love feast kind of meals where we all share everything. And also the uh, the ultimate love feast, the Lord's Supper. And then the prayers, the, those of the more liturgical element would see in the word the, the these kind of prescribed kind of prayers that are not so much uh, extemporaneous prayers where you're just saying what's on your heart, but they are uh, prayers like you would, you would, uh, Psalms, for instance, would be one of these kind of things, uh, prescribed prayers where it certainly is something that you are praying, but you're also contemplating, contemplating it. And you're hoping that that prayer, that pre-written prayer, that, uh, um, composed prayer works on your heart and becomes your prayer. And of course, we do this with the Lord's Prayer that we pray every Sunday in our church uh, because Jesus said, when you pray, say, and so we do. Uh, but it's not a prayer necessarily that your heart just wells up with every time you pray it. It, it, it is the prayer of our heart, but it's also a prayer of contemplation. Uh, and when we pray it, we are we're really kind of asking God to make this into the prayer of our heart to mold it that way. So let's, uh, we're going to take each of these. We, we, we're breaking it down. We're really breaking it down, especially here in the beginning. We've got the whole text. Now we've got the verse. And now we're going to break this down and look at the teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. Start with the teaching. Uh, the apostles' teaching. The Bible uh, speaks of the scriptures being something that is more than just wisdom from people, that is worth studying and uh, worth hearing from and worth letting work on ourselves. Uh, talks about the Word of God being living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Uh, here, Paul writes to second to Timothy uh, in his second letter to Timothy about using the Scriptures in the life of the church. Paul writes to Timothy, who was a young pastor, by the way, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And so he points Timothy, uh, the pastor, to make sure he's using the scripture and all of the scripture. I think that word all there is very important. It's not just some. It's not just the easy stuff. It's all scripture. Uh, and, and some of it's very hard. And in fact, uh, writers of the Bible, Peter acknowledges, for instance, that uh, some things written are very difficult to understand. Uh, in this verse here, uh, 2 Peter 3 verses 15 to 16, Peter, who uh, Peter's a fisherman, right? So Peter's an uneducated fisherman. And then you got Paul, who is a, a highly educated, just you know, Paul is the Paul is the student with the 5.0 GPA. Uh, he's he is the um, valedictorian of the class. And then Peter is a fisherman and they've both been been given uh, revealed truth. God has inspired them in these writings, and yet he has inspired those people to write. And so they are writing out of who they are as well. And evidently, some people were complaining about the things Paul wrote, because Peter uh, writes, he doesn't back away from what Paul wrote, He but he acknowledges that uh, they are difficult. Let me read to you. This is Second Peter chapter 3, verses 15 to 16. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. And so 
here's a, a couple of things. One is Peter's acknowledging that, that some things are hard to understand. And uh, that's good information for us to bear in mind because not everything comes to us immediately. And the other thing we notice is that Peter considers Paul's writings scripture, the just as they do the other scripture. They're twisting Paul's writings. And so here we, we see that the apostles considered the, the writings that we have in the New Testament uh, considered them scripture as well, even here. So that's the first thing they devoted themselves to is learning the apostles teaching. So this is a this is a learning community. There's not a it's not a static community. It's a growing, seeking, grappling community that is learning and growing and, and even wrestling with things that are hard to understand. Uh, not to uh, not to twist them to what we want, but to acknowledge the difficulty and to struggle with them and work with them. And that's the first thing, the apostles' teaching. The church is a learning community. The second thing is the fellowship. And and the fellowship is, is uh, the body of Christ uh, living together in relationship with one another. And there's like a million verses about this, so I had to just pick a few. Um, a few that I think are uh, really worth uh, reading. The first one is in the New Testament book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verses 24 to 25. The author writes, Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. The day drawing near is, is the second coming of Christ. But more importantly, this is a, isn't this a beautiful picture? This is a community that gathers together for what? Uh, to stir one another up, to be loving and to do good things in their life. And, and don't give up that gathering together, uh, the writer to Hebrews writes. And so... As we uh, read this, it seems uh, like that is a timeless encouragement not to give up gathering together as some are in the habit of doing. But let's keep gathering together for the sake of love and good works. So it's an encouraging community. The other thing we find about the community in the two verses that I chose anyways are that it's a, it's a community where people are growing and they are growing because they speak the truth in love. And those of you who have known me very long know this verse comes out of my mouth all the time because I find this is a foundational verse for life. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 15 to 16. Rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with, every, with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so it builds itself up in love. And there again, the, the, the mark of the community of God, the mark of his people, the mark of, uh, of doing life together, of koinonia, is love. But it's not love that whitewashes truth, that, that glosses over things. It's love that speaks the truth in such a way that it encourages us. And I mean, just imagine a, a church. Well, I think I don't have to imagine it because we have one. <laughs> but what a great description of a place a church is. These last two verses, people who gather together for the purpose of encouraging each other and spurring each other on to be loving and to be filled with good works in their life. And a place where the truth is spoken in love so that people grow. So that's the second thing. We have the teaching of the apostles and the fellowship. And the third thing that is in uh, that rather meaty little verse is the breaking of bread. And uh, I want to give you a little uh, technical term here. It, the word is synecdoche. And a synecdoche is a figure of speech by which a part is uh, made to stand in for the whole. Uh, and so that, that means like... Uh, um, well, if, uh, it, it's where you would refer to a, a piece of something, but pe the hearers know you mean the whole thing. Like, did you get a new set of wheels? Now, you're not, in almost every circumstance, you're not actually talking about wheels, but you're talking about a whole car, right? And so um, 
the scholars who read this, at least the majority of them probably, uh, would look at the breaking of bread and see that as synecdic synecdoche, uh, meaning uh, a shorthand for uh, the whole celebration of the Lord's Supper. But they, they did tend to have these uh, shared meals together all the time also. So it, it, so it's a little bit... Um, the idea of the Lord's Supper and the idea of the shared meals are not unclear. What is not entirely clear is to which of those this particular phrase refers. So I am going to take us down the road of the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 16 to 17, Paul's writing to the church in Corinth about the Lord's Supper, which they were already celebrating more often. Uh, and it, it seems quite clear that they celebrated it as a matter of habit, not just once a year connected with the Passover celebration. Paul writes to them, The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation? That's a fellowship. In the blood of Christ, the bread that we break, is it not a participation? in the body of Christ. Because there's one bread, we who are many are one body, because we all partake of the one bread. And so Paul is writing about the Lord's Supper as, as something that is uh, a sharing. We all we are sharing in the blood, body and blood of Christ, and so we are sharing uh, with each other as well. We are all participants in one body. And then uh, a little, the next chapter in Corinthians, Paul shares uh, very specifically, what he received from Jesus Christ. He writes, uh, this is 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 to 26. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And by the way, there's a little synecdoche in there as well. Uh, he says, This cup is my covenant, is the new covenant in my blood. And what he's really referring to is the wine there, the whole, the whole thing. So uh, we have the breaking of bread, the celebration of the Lord's Supper being uh, this participation with Christ and with one another. And the fourth thing listed in there is the prayers. And a prayer is part of what we all share uh, in participation together as we do our life together, as we uh, live out the koinonia, the fellowship of Christ Paul writes to the Colossians in Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 to 3. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. And so there's the, uh, the exhortation to continually, uh, to continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful with thanksgiving. And you'll, you'll find uh, the steadfastness of prayer and being thankful in all things, uh, living with thankful hearts, you'll find that woven throughout the New Testament. And that's part of the participation of our shared life together is this. Uh, it's a life of thanksgiving. It's a thankful heart life. Uh, moving along to Paul's letter to the Philippians, uh, he's writing about prayer and he says, do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And so again, the, the, the prayer, prayer is part of what uh, the fellowship of believers do. And we do it with thankful hearts. It is about our requests. But, but we leave them with God and, and, and God trades us for the peace that passes all understanding. So that is a, a, a galloping overview of the first verse of our passage. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. The prayers.
Now we're going to move on a little more quickly. Uh, and, and it's natural that we should because the rest of the verses don't uh, contain quite the meat that that one verse did. That was quite a summary verse of all their life, right? <laughs> So, verse 43, Acts 2, verse 43. Whoop, where we go? There we go. Did I miss one? Oh, let me back up. Sorry about that. And I'm not going to go edit this because uh, this is a weekly thing and it's only part of our ministry. So I just run through it on the fly and, and whatever happens, happens, unless it's something really, really horrible. <laughs> so uh, one more thing about prayer is who we pray for. Uh, and, and and we don't just pray for uh, our brothers and sisters in Christ, but really, uh, Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Uh, here in Paul, Paul's first letter to the young pastor Timothy, this is in chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, Paul writes, First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. So there's really no no excluding anybody there. And then he gets more narrow for kings and for all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And so our prayers are for everybody, including the leaders of our government. Uh, Now we move on to Acts chapter 2, verse 43. It says, And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And and often that comes up about these wonders and signs. What happens to them? Where where are they now? And there's a couple things worth pointing out here. One is that this particular verse says they were done through the apostles. And if you uh, recall, you might recall, uh, back in the Gospels, Jesus, out of his all of his disciples, he took 12 and appointed them apostles. And so this says the signs were being done through the apostles. And and so that kind of narrows it down, right? And there is another thing to notice is that it says through the apostles, not by the apostles. And so In there, we just subtly see woven in there that it is actually God who is doing the signs and wonders. It's just through the apostles. Uh, But here we have the apostles. And and so people naturally ask, well, where are the miracles today? And of course, we have uh, some people who uh, have experienced miracles uh, of of varying degrees. We also have a bunch of really funky, odd things I, I saw. I saw a video on the internet about the, uh, what is that? I can't remember what it was called. It was called the gold dust blessing or something. And, and people would start praying and then, and like gold dust would appear, uh, uh, gold glitter would appear on their Bibles. Or like if they were praying for their arm to be healed, gold dust would appear on their arm and stuff. And I don't know. It's, uh, I'm a little skeptical of things like that, but I certainly do know of, people who would say they have experienced miracles and just from by way of observation they seem to uh, happen more on what you might call the front wave of uh, gospel expansion they, they seem to happen more uh, as the as the good news of Jesus is going through different lands we, we hear of miraculous things happening and of course uh, miracles don't um, don't confirm the uh, the veracity, the truth of whatever is being preached, but they certainly do get people's attention to get them to listen. And that's really what uh, in most places is needed is people just to get to get their attention. So they will listen to the word and then the Holy Spirit can convict them through the word of God and on and so forth from there. And, and so uh, the things that I've read seem to indicate that that more miracles, a lot more miracles seem to happen right on the cutting edge of where the gospel is being preached for the first time. Um, but that's a whole nother study. I, I, there's every verse, I'm, there's going to be like several things that are, that's a whole nother study because this is a galloping romp through. So with that galloping wrong through, here we go. Next verse. 
And all who believed were together and had all things in common. Now, this this is uh, it, it's not it is not that they actually sold everything and lived on a commune like a kibbutz or whatever, where they actually had they all of everybody got rid of their stuff and they just had a common purse. That is not the picture uh, that we actually receive of what the early church did. It's more their mindset that they didn't consider anything their own, that they uh, they considered everything under their stewardship, that all they had and all they are was under their stewardship and was a gift from God to be put to use for God's purposes in the world. Um, If we uh, pop ahead a couple chapters uh, to Acts chapter 4, verse 32, we see that. It says, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. Uh, so, so there's this sense that uh, that all the things we have in our are for the larger purpose of the Lord. And in fact, they're all gifts of the Lord. And so we don't actually own them in that way. We are stewards. We are managers of God's things. And then uh, we, we even see that in the next verse. Now we're going back to Acts 2. This is the next verse in that little set of verses that is our text for this Bible study. Acts chapter 2 verse 45 continues this on. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. So they, if they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds as they had need, they were keeping control of their own assets, but they, were, uh, they saw those assets as to be used uh, for the Lord's work. And so as needed, they were not uh, afraid they were not reticent to dispose of their assets for the work of the Lord if uh, that need came up. So what we're really talking about is they took care of each other. There was nobody was in need. That's one of the things they would that was said about the early church. Nobody was in need. And now uh, th- that picture is such a sort of a, a, a leave it to beaver kind of picture that we we need to be careful to realize that that even in the earliest of the early church, it's a place made up of broken saints, broken people, uh, that there are sinners and and things happen. This is not the 100% perfect community. Uh, And one of the episodes that's recorded for us is in Acts chapter 5, right after this Acts 2, 42 to 47. We have in Acts 5 uh, an account of a man named Ananias. And here's, uh, I'm just going to read to you, Acts chapter 5, verses 1 to 2. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, if if I read you the whole story, what you would hear is that um, Ananias brought the money for the property and and wanted to appear uh, better than he was, I guess, is one way to say it. And so the Bible says he brought it and, and that it was, he said it was all the money, but it wasn't really all the money. And uh, so in this instance, uh, the uh, the judgment was swift and complete uh, and and the Holy Spirit actually slew him. Uh, because he lied to the Holy Spirit. And then his wife came in and the apostles questioned her and said, is that all the money you got for the property? And she said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they said, well, listen, here come the feet of the men who just carried your husband's body out and they're going to carry you out too. And then she fell down dead. And But we need to read that very carefully because uh, the the apostles said, wasn't it your property before you sold it? And wasn't, didn't all the proceeds, weren't they all yours uh, to do with what you wanted after you sold it? So why would you come here and say it's all of it when it's not really all of it? The problem isn't that they sold the property and kept part of the money for themselves. That was not the problem. The problem was that they sold the property. And they came and they said, we sold a piece of property and here's all the money. Aren't we great? And uh, they secretly kept some back. The, the problem is they weren't living in truth. And 
like everything else, there's a whole deeper study to go along with that. But uh, that's that's how that's working. So now continuing on, we are uh, on verse 46, and we're making good time now because we we blew past that very dense verse. And here's what here's how their life went. Acts chapter two verse 46. Day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. And so here we, this is, this is an, a nice, simple picture it, it, they didn't quit going to the temple, by the way. They they still they met in the temple courts, and they also met from house to house. And so they were together. They they acknowledged their fellowship in public, and they celebrated their fellowship in people's homes. They shared meals together. They were a family, right? I mean, that's that's probably the closest word you're going to get. In in the Old Testament, uh, one of my favorite verses in the Old Testament says, "The Lord sets the lonely in families." And this picture of the early church in Acts shows the church acting like a family, even having people who are not acting so well. I mean, that's what happens in families too, right? And and so we have this picture of the church acting like a family. They're in public together. They're in people's homes together. And they are loving each other. And they're taking care of each other. And uh, it says that, that people noticed this. And they had favor with all the people. And what happened? The Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. And, and so uh, since, since we talked about uh, the, studying the word and we talked about the breaking of bread as the Lord's Supper, I just felt like it was appropriate to end with one more verse that, that ties in with this concept of the Lord adding to the number of people who are being saved. Because the celebration of baptism is... is an ongoing thing of the an ongoing sacrament of the church in so far as uh, as new people come into the church they're baptized but we don't everybody doesn't get rebaptized once a month or whatever it's that's the beginning that's the birth that is the new birth uh, in with water and the word and so when this says uh, the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved we can uh, read into that that baptism was happening regularly as well. Uh, next week, we're going to hear a, a story of an um, Ethiopian official who uh, met a, a, one of the disciples named Philip who explained to him the scriptures, and, and he stopped his chariot and said, here's some water. Can I be baptized right now? And they did it. And, and so baptisms were happening regularly even though they weren't mentioned in uh, that list in the first verse we studied, because they are the, that's the initiating sacrament, not the ongoing sacrament of the church. But you'll remember uh, from before, if, if you listen to these regularly, uh, in Acts 2, verse 38, right before what we read, Peter had been preaching to the crowd uh, on Pentecost, and they said, what should we do? And Peter said to them, and now I'm reading to you from Acts 2, verse 38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so there we really have uh, the, the, the whole picture of the early church right there in, in, a, in a nutshell. And it, it's, it's a beautiful picture, it, but it's not a picture of a, of a church without flaws uh, even in Acts, it's already a picture of a church that struggles with sin. And all you have to do is read a little further in the New Testament and find out that uh, that the, st on the struggle with sin goes on. And so it is a church that is not uh, doesn't find its fellowship and its unity in living perfect lives. It finds its fellowship and its unity with uh, in Christ Jesus who died uh, to create the church and to bring forgiveness of sins and life everlasting to all who turn to him. So that's where we're going to end it. Uh, the life in the early church. 
the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread and the prayers, and of course, the ongoing uh, baptisms of the new people who uh, joined in the fellowship of Jesus Christ. And now if you're in a small group, these are the questions that you'll be discussing. And if you're not in a small group, uh, here are some questions for you to think about or to talk about with other people or to maybe attract you into a small group uh, where you can celebrate all the different aspects of fellowship that we share in Jesus Christ. Here's the discussion questions. Number one, in what ways does life in the early church seem attractive? In what ways not so much? Number two, what would you say is the center of life in the early church? And is it any different today? Number three, have you experienced anything that you consider a miracle? Number four, of the four activities listed in verse 42, studying the teachings, caring for each other, praying, and celebrating the Lord's Supper and or sharing meals, we'll leave that one open. Which brings the most meaning into your faith life right now? Which is the one that really rings with you the most, if any? You can talk about it instead of, you don't have to single one out. You can just share about it. But, but maybe one of them is really sort of your sweet spot right now. Those things go in cycles. So there's no, there's, it's no, um, one of them is not more important than the other. And, and there's not, not one of that, one of them is not like the more spiritual answer or anything like that. I, I think our lives just, as we go through the journey of our spiritual life, different uh, different parts of our spiritual life, different parts of this life together uh, tend to take on more prominence uh, and more, uh, they, they do a little bit more of what we need at that moment. And so that's just something to thought, think about. And number five, I always end with this, what struck you? Well, that's Dig Deeper for Sunday, May 11th, 2014, or whenever you're reading it or watching or listening to this. Uh, I'm Pastor John Rollison from Journey of Life Lutheran Church in Orlando, Florida. Our website is www.journeyoflife.org. And I'm glad you're listening. God bless you. Thank you.